Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to this very exciting session on a very, very cold Tuesday night. So hopefully this is going to kind of challenge you, uh, excite you, uh, get you warm, whichever way we can think about it. Um, presentation um, on a, a book talk actually by author uh, Diana Dark. Um, now this series, the series of lectures, they are hosted by the SOAS Middle East Institute and they are co-hosted by myself. Uh, I'm Dina Mater and I'm the chair of the Center for Palestine Studies at SOAS and by uh, Nargis Farzad who is also here and she is the chair of the Center for Iranian Studies. Um, Diana has very kindly uh, agreed to come and talk to us about her exciting book, Stealing from the Saracens. And um, it's quite a, I've, I've read most of it, and it is an, a very exciting read, very well researched topic, and kind of brings different perspective to this whole thing about uh, the constant argument between the East and the West about where civilization starts, who started what, and so on. But she comes to it from an art historian uh, background, also from a background of having lived in the region, particularly in Syria, for uh, a very long time, um, I think 30 years on and off. Uh, she is a very well-known author. Uh, she has written um, uh, recent books, particularly on Syria. One is called The Merchant of Syria, A History of Survival, and the other one is My House in, um, in Damascus. For anyone who's interested in, in reading about ordinary people and about people living under very, very difficult circumstances for a very long period of time, I really uh, recommend uh, these two books. They're written very well um, you know, you can relate to them even if you haven't been uh, to the region and you, you don't know uh, much about it, but it's a, almost an intimate history um, or people's history of, uh, of Syria. Um, Diana is going to give a presentation of 40 uh, to 45 minutes. Uh, she has a PowerPoint. And may I encourage all of you to put your questions in the question box, question and answer box at the bottom. Um, where um, you know you can uh, you can uh, ask the questions, and I'll try my best to um, to uh, collate the, the questions and then pose them to uh, Diana. Um, it looks like we we have a huge attendance, Diana. So well done, you. One hundred eighty participants so far, and these are people on the Zoom. I don't know whether that includes the people on Facebook, but this is our highest number of attendees. So uh, really looking forward to what you have to say. I'm not putting you on the spot here or making you nervous. I'm sure you will never be nervous. So uh, please go ahead and welcome to SOAS and thanks for uh, coming over. Well, thank you very much, Dina and, and Nargis for, for hosting this. And I'm going to um, go straight into uh, sharing my screen so that I can take you through a um a whole um i just need to move um the boxes are blocking my um ability to to get to my slideshow um mm. So I just need to, oh, there we go, I managed to get rid of them, that's it, okay, um, great, okay, so if, um, if everybody can see this um, now, uh, so I'm going to take you on a sort of virtual journey um, through the various discoveries that I made in researching this book. Um, and I'll start with explaining the title, because that's been rather controversial, uh, Stealing from the Saracens, How Islamic Architecture Shaped Europe. Now, stealing from the Saracens, it's a very, very deliberate choice. I, I must um, clarify that because people have challenged me, oh, what do you mean stealing? You know, how can you be so, so controversial? But the reason is, and this is explained in the introduction of the book, 
that um, the commonest derivation of the Saracens is from the Arabic sarafa to steal. So Sarakin Saracens are people who steal. So the idea is it's a double irony that we are taking things from people we called thieves. And the reason that the word Saracen is so important and had to be in the title is because Christopher Wren, when he designed uh, St. Paul's Cathedral, which you'll see there on the right, and the, and the cover itself, the, in, the interior of the dome there, Christopher Wren said, when I, when I built St. Paul's, I used Saracen vaulting. And this is the key thing. This is why we've, we've gone for this, um, this uh, referencing of, of St. Paul's. And um, uh, Christopher Wren coincided in his time in Oxford in the 17th century with a huge flourishing of Arabic um, scholarship. The, the Laudian professorship of Arabic was set up, uh, which is still there to this day. So he coincided with a great deal of information coming in from the Arab world. So although he never traveled there himself, he, he saw many diagrams and, and read many, many reports of other people and questioned many people. So he, he, had a, he had a vast knowledge and he wrote this at the end of his very long life. He lived to be 90. Um, and so, you know, it was a very considered opinion. So that's why I wanted to um, research this. And just to mention at uh, the bottom there, if, if anybody's interested in buying the book, um, the best place is to go straight to the Hearst website and put in that code of Saracens25. And that will give a 25% discount with free postage within the UK, um, five pounds for postage within Europe and seven pounds 50 for anywhere else in the world. So that's actually much better than anything Amazon is offering. So the thing that triggered me to write this book was the fire at Notre Dame, which is why I've actually dedicated the book to Notre Dame. And when that fire happened and the whole world was transfixed at the sight of this extraordinary building going up in flames and there was France went into mass mourning and said our national identity is burning and all of this from a secular country and and it made me uh, sort of sit up and think wait a minute you know you're claiming all of this as your own invention don't you realize that the backstory of Gothic comes from way further to the east and, and because nobody appeared to know that um, that's basically why I wrote the book, to explain um, the backstory of Gothic architecture. Now, on the right-hand side of the picture, you'll see a decapitated saint called Dennis. And he is actually on the facade of Notre Dame. And he is one of three Dennises. This is uh, where, where, at many points, actually, in the story, it becomes quite, quite funny, that sort of medieval muddle and tangled tales of mistaken identities, because... It turns out there are three Dennises. There's this one who is the patron saint of France. Then there was a, a disciple of St. Paul um, who wrote a very famous um, and influential book called The Celestial Hierarchy. But centuries later, after the Gothic style had already uh, was, was, you know, had actually virtually finished, later scholarship discovered that this this disciple of St. Paul was actually an imposter and the real Dennis was a Syrian monk from the fifth century. So this brings us to Syria because um, unsurprisingly, early Christianity began in this part of the world. So um, for the first few centuries, there was nothing that we would recognize as a church. The earliest actual building that's been identified as a church is the house church, so-called at Dura Europos. Um, which is third century, Doria Ropos being a multicultural city uh, on the Euphrates. But uh, the place where the thing that we would start to recognize as early Christian architecture began is here in Syria. For the fourth, fifth, and sixth centuries, we have what is collectively referred to in, in Syria as the dead cities. This is in northwest Syria. And here you have hundreds of early Byzantine settlements um, that show the transition from, from Roman pagan architecture into early Christian architecture. And on the left there, one of the most important churches is called Kalblause, Heart of the Almond. And it is the earliest example of a style that has come to be known now as Romanesque, or what the English call Norman. 
And this is the Twin Towers flanking a monumental entrance. And the reason this was built was on, a, on the pilgrimage route uh, to St. Simeon's Basilica on, on the right of your picture there. Now, St. Simeon was uh, a very famous um, preacher from the top of his pillar. The stylos is, is Greek for pillar. That's why he was called St. Simeon Stylites. And when he died, um, uh, the basilica was built on, on, on the spot where he preached from, and that is the remains of his pillar. And in, uh, at, that, at that time, and we're talking here late fifth century, um, the, the basilica was completed in, in 490. And um, it was the, the prime pilgrimage destination of, of, of its time. People would come from all over Europe to, to visit it. It was the Santiago de Compostela of its day. And the detailing on the St. Simeon's Basilica uh, is quite phenomenal. Uh, if you look at the quality there of the stone masonry, you have this very famous uh, motif that only exists in Syria, the swaying acanthus, so-called, the way these leaves, um, they've managed to convey movement into it. And this is very, very typical Syrian, this sort of the, the effusive nature. You see this right from the beginning in, 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 the, in the pagan architecture, in places like Palmyra and Baalbek, and then it also comes into the, the early Christian architecture. Um, and the reason for this is because uh, Syria is covered in limestone, and so it's, it is the prime building material, and so it, the, the craft of stone masonry is literally as old as the hills. These are some images of St. Simeon in Europe, because as I mentioned, he was incredibly influential in Europe. So there are two villages in France named St. Simeon after him. And on the left there is the picture of St. Simeon standing on his pillar in a stained glass window. And on the right is St. Simeon on his pillar in a mosaic in, inside St. Mark's in Venice. And uh, the very um, influential uh, place that was uh, from, from the dead cities, Antioch was the main uh, port just, just uh, on, on the coast, and Antioch was the mosaic center that was incredibly influential for Ravenna. So, um, in fact, the earliest uh, the church that no longer exists in, uh, that was originally built in the fourth century in Antioch, um, in an octagonal shape, is thought to be the direct um, model for San Vitale in, 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 uh, in, in Ravenna. And it, it's this octagonal shape. And, and so here we have uh, this, this mosaic I've chosen here happens to be from uh, Santa Polinare in Classe, Classe being the port of Ravenna, which was full of Syrians. And the Syrian backstory of Ravenna, again, is very un, un, unresearched, but I, I discovered a huge backstory to Ravenna, basically, that shows all these Syrian influences. So Santa Polinaris himself came, the patron saint of, of Ravenna, he came from, from Antioch, and um, every single bishop up until the year 425 was from Syria. Um, in fact, there were complaints that there were so many Syrian bankers and Syrian merchants in the city. And, and so the, the people paying for these, um, for these extraordinary early churches were mainly very wealthy Syrian merchants. And this is the octagonal shape that they were copying um, from, from the earliest um, churches in, in Syria. That octagonal shape went on to influence Aachen. We know that Charles Magne, in his when he built his Palatine Chapel in Aachen, was very influenced by Ravenna. He went there three times. He pillaged quite a bit of stuff from it. And, and actually, um, looking at, at the Palatine Chapel, you, it immediately has this sort of Eastern feel, if you like, the ablak of the arches there, the, the contrasting colors. Very Syrian design again, because in Syria you have the white limestone and the black basalt. So these, this this kind of arch is is very distinctively Syrian. So so this is this is the uh, what the early Muslims had to build on when when they came into Syria, and and the Umayyad Caliphate was established with its capital at Damascus. Um, they of course uh, had. The, the pre-Islamic inheritance. There's a big chapter in the book devoted to this because it is obviously so important. 
and you will see how their first, the first Umayyad political statement as, as a building was the Dome of the Rock in, in Jerusalem. And you'll see how um, some people say, oh, well, it's just a Byzantine copy, isn't it? You know, but it's not at all. The, all right, yes, they've used the, the octagonal shape um, and the dome, but all the decorative mosaic work is on the outside, and that is completely new. That never happened in Byzantine buildings. It was, they were plain on the outside, and all the mosaic was inside. But not only that, there are two more innovations in the Dome of the Rock that are very, very important for later uh, Gothic. So um, on the arcade at the bottom, you'll see the pointed arches. The first pointed arches appear. And up under the dome, you see the first trefoil arches, the little triple lobed arches appearing up there under the dome. And then the Umayyads uh, also built the Umayyad Mosque. And it's worth mentioning, um, because it's important to understand that, that when the early Muslims came into Syria, um, they were actually, uh, there are contemporary records showing that uh, the, the indigenous population actually mistook them for another Christian sect to begin with. They didn't even realize that this was a completely different um, religion. And for, uh, for, for a long time, Muslims actually shared the churches all over Syria. They, and and uh, in Damascus was a case in point. I mean, that had always been the sacred heart of the city. So uh, way back in Aramean times, it had been a temple to a weather god, and then uh, the Greeks had made it into a temple of Zeus, the, the Romans had made it into a temple of Jupiter, and the Christians had made it into a, a cathedral for John the Baptist. And so when the Muslims came, they actually shared that building of uh, the cathedral, and they entered through the same entrance, and the Muslims turned one way and the Christians turned the other way. And that arrangement only came to an end after nearly a century when they physically ran out of space. And at that point, the, the Muslims said to the Christians, look, we, in exchange for taking over this building completely, will give you the land for four churches. And so that's, that's what they did. And to this day, those four churches are among the 17 churches that still exist in, uh, in, in the old city of Damascus. And on a Sunday morning, you still hear church bells ringing out and, and blending with the call to prayer. So you only have to look at this uh, Damascus Umayyad Mosque to see how blended the architecture is because the early Muslims embraced the, the cultures there. They didn't in any way seek to obliterate them. Um, so you can see that they've taken in there the, the sort of Hellenistic uh, gable and, and the Byzantine dome. And the, the minaret here, the square shape, is, is modeled on uh, the, the Christian bell towers of the churches. Uh, they were always square like that. And so the, the early um, minarets were square, the Umayyad minarets, and this one is even called the Jesus minaret in a very typical example of the sort of blending of Christian and Muslim tradition in, in this region. It's called the Jesus minaret because local, local legend has it that Christ will descend from, uh, from that minaret on, on the day of judgment. Now this is a detail of the mosaics inside the courtyard of the Umayyad mosque. And again, you can see how blended it all is. So you've got the um, you, you, you've got typical uh, Byzantine mosaic work, and I'm sure Byzantine craftsmen were employed on this, working for new Muslim masters. But they've 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 used the the Muslim iconography, the sort of visions of paradise with gardens and trees and rivers and fantasized buildings. But they've incorporated here that the. the triple arch, which represents the Trinity in, in the early Christian churches that they will have seen. They've used the um, classical pillars and capitals there. Um, so they, they've absorbed and blended everything into something new. They've synthesized it, if you like. And then over here on, on the left is um, a detail of the inside of the Dome of the Rock, where you can see more closely these little trefoil arches. Now, another innovation in the, in the Umayyad Mosque is um, geometric window grills, and those come over into, into Europe gradually, and the example I've chosen here happens to be um, in, in, from, from St. Mark's in Venice, where they are um, very, very extensively used. And the Umayyads also, in their secular architecture, um, 
you, you'll see here, this is the entrance to the Damascus National Museum. And it's actually a reconstruction of uh, an Umayyad desert palace called Qasr al-Hayr al-Gharbi. And it has um, very, you'll see again, that it's the twin towers, if you like, flanking a monumental entrance. It's the same concept that's been carried over now into early Islamic art. And the detailing on some of these palaces is, is again, this sort of exuberance of nature that, that we saw in St. Simeon's is now come over into the Umayyad um, stonework here. This, this detail happens to be of uh, Qasr Mushatta, which is um, in actually in, in the Berlin um, Museum of Islamic Art. So you can get really close to it and see it, see it very well. And then the other um, innovation in, in a different um, early Umayyad palace is in um, a Hisham's palace, palace or Khirbat al-Mafjar, which is in what's today um, the, um, the occupied West Bank near, near Jericho. And some scholars have seen in this window um, the earliest example of a rose window because it was found um, high up in the uh, audience chamber of the palace and fragments of stained glass were found in the excavations. So um, they know it was used for decorative light to come through. And so it takes then uh, five centuries before you get to the absolute apogee of a stained glass rose window in Chartres Cathedral there on the, on the right. And then talking of stained glass, this again was a, a, an extraordinary discovery um, that I wasn't expecting, but the glass itself it turns out that between the years 1200 and 1400, um, most of our great cathedrals across France and, and indeed in, in this country, in Canterbury um, and in York, um, the glass has been analyzed and has been found to have what they call Islamic composition. And this is because the raw materials um, are so superior. Um, Syria was actually the, the world leader in glass under the Abbasids and, and Raqqa, which of course we only know from ISIS fame these days, Raqqa was, um, was the great glass workshop center uh, under Harun al-Rashid when he built his palaces there. And it, it, the reason the, the glass there is so superb was because of the quality of the raw materials, the pebbles from the Euphrates and the local salty plant um, which was used in the flux to, to um, uh, was called Ushnan. And that blend made the most extraordinary quality of glass, this wonderful thick organic glass with, with bubbles. And it's very, very strong, incredibly strong. And so when the um, crusaders came and, and took, took Jerusalem later, they discovered um, the quality of this glass and shipped it back to Europe in huge quantities to make these early stained glass windows. So that is Umayyad Syria, if you like. And of course, then the way a lot of these innovations come into the European mainland is into Umayyad Spain, because here, here we have an aerial view of the Cordova Mesquita in Spain. And of course, the Umayyad prince who set, who set all this up and who made Cordova his, his capital was the only one to escape in 750 when the Abbasids came in. Uh, and took over, and he escaped, managed to make his way across North Africa, and um, against all the odds, managed to set up um, an extraordinary uh, rule that evolved into a caliphate, and um, and his successors then ruled in Spain for many years. So, and added extensions to this mosque. So, this this mosque is built in the eighth century, and that was then extended in the ninth and the tenth century. But we'll see in it so many of the things that we've seen in Syria. So this is the minaret of it, and now it's starting to go up in, in registers, um, but again, sort of resembling in some ways, um, you know, it looks, and in fact, of course, these days, it is the Christian bell tower of what has been turned into the cathedral. But here we have an astonishing innovation. Um, this is in the 10th century extension, and this is the ribbed vault um, in front of the mihrab. And this was examined for the first time by structural engineers in 2015, who got special permission to go in and do an extensive survey. 
and they were flabbergasted by what they found. They said they had never seen such an example of geometric perfection, and it has never needed repair in its entire thousand year existence. And this is because by the 10th century, um, the knowledge of geometry had come over from the Abbasid court. It was, um, and so, so stonemasons acquired this astonishing, had, had this astonishing knowledge, which was not common in Europe at all at this time. And you can see the trefoil arches there along the bottom of the screen. Um, and, uh, and again, they used in, in the holiest places. Now in the Cordoba Mesquita, at the, on the back wall, there is a whole um, display of the Mason's marks. These were found in the foundations, um, in, in renovation works. And when you look at them, they are overwhelmingly Muslim, written in Arabic, a handful are, are, are Christian, um, but they are overwhelmingly Muslim, showing that these are Muslim Masons who worked on the Mesquita. And here is a detail of the Mehrab itself, and you can see the, tree, the row of trefoil arches there across the top, uh, and the horseshoe arch, which also began in, 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 in the Damascus Umayyad Mosque in a very slight form, becomes more accentuated here in Cordoba. And also the arches, again, this alternating pattern, and here in Cordoba, it's red and white because Abdul Rahman, the, uh, the, the, the Umayyad, who, who, the prince who escaped, those are his dynastic colors, red and white. So the arches um, reflect that and they have double arcades and it makes this extraordinary sort of spatial web in, when you're inside there where you, you kind of lose all sense of direction. And you don't know where the beginning or the end is. A very, very different concept to how um, Christian architecture evolved in, in Gothic. Um, but, uh, and here's, an, here's a gateway of the Cordoba Mesquita, again, covered in arches because the Umayyads loved arches. And so in every opportunity, the decoration is arches. So you've got the trefoil arch there. And then inside you've got sankfoil arches with five lobes. And of course, rather incongruously, um, crucifixes put inside because it is now a cathedral. Um, and then here, this is also in Cordoba, but this is no longer the mosque, this is the synagogue in Cordoba, because the Jews who lived there um, were, um, you know, valued members of society, and they chose to adopt the Islamic designs. And so in their, in their synagogue, they used the same patterning, the same styles. And when they were uh, expelled in the Reconquista and, and expelled from Spain, when they, um, uh, wherever they went, they chose more often than not to use, to rebuild their synagogues in, in Islamic style. Probably the most famous one is in, um, is in Berlin. And then Medina to Zahra. So after Cordoba in the 10th century, um, the caliphs moved, moved to just outside uh, Cordoba. So in the, in the countryside, just outside and built the most astonishing and opulent palace, the like of which had never been seen in Europe. And, and there was a steady stream of, of bishops and, and diplomats coming to visit this who would have seen all these extraordinary styles and begun to be influenced by them. So that's Muslim Spain. That's a major way, obviously, that um, influences came into Europe. Another way is through Amalfi, um, a, a trading, trading port on the Italian coast. And this, this, we know, is the way that the pointed arch first arrived into Europe. And we know this because in the church histories, it is actually recorded. Um, the, the monasteries and abbeys were, were very good at keeping detailed histories, so we know what their building programs were. And here on the left, we have Amalfi Cathedral, and the merchants at Amalfi were trading with Cairo and noticed the Ibn Tulun Mosque with its pointed arches. And so they liked the style, brought it back and used it in Amalfi. And then um, a very influential abbot from Monte Cassino came and visited Amalfi and saw the pointed arches and said, I want those too in my, in my monastery. And so he imported the workmen, imported some raw materials and built them at Monte Cassino. And then the abbot of Cluny, which is the Benedictine powerhouse, you know, the most influential um, abbey in, 
in the, in the whole of, of uh, France. And uh, he visited Monte Cassino, saw the pointed arches and decided I would like those in my monastery too, and also imported the craftsmen to do it because of course local, local craftsmen were not familiar with the ways of doing this. So, and this is, as I mentioned, all recorded in, in, in the church histories. And so once Cluny had it, of course, it was like setting the fashion. I mean, the top dog had pointed arches. So after that, all the bishops in their respective cities wanted pointed arches. And the pointed arches enabled them to gradually build higher and higher. And this is when you, it almost became competitive with the Gothic cathedrals. Now, another route through which um, these styles entered, of course, was Sicily. And here is a picture in Palermo, the Palatine Chapel there, where you've got Fatimid arches, you've got the Byzantine mosaics, and then you've got the Mokarnas in the ceiling on the right-hand side. We know that the craftsmen there were Muslim, um, because again, it, it's, it's recorded that they came, they came over from, um, from Fatimid Cairo. And so these styles now start to make their way into, into France from all these gateways, if you like, from Muslim Spain, from Sicily. And, and so um, because the pointed arch has now become um, popular at Cluny, Cluny is at this stage sponsoring the pilgrimage route to Santiago de Compostela. And it builds a series of shrines, Cluniac shrines along the route. And these uh, shrines, cathedrals start to show the influence of these is Islamic buildings. And so this is Le Puy Cathedral, and you will see that it's copying the ablak of the arches. It's got Kufic inscriptions in, in various places, and um, it has some, some uh, pointed arches as well. And also at this time, um, the Normans, of course, who, who were on the Crusades and also in, in Sicily, um, bring the pointed arch from, uh, from Spain, from Sicily, they bring it back into Durham Cathedral. So on, on the left of your picture here, this is the Galilee Chapel in um, Durham Cathedral. And you'll see this interlocking blind arches almost identical to one of the gateways on the Cordoba Mesquita. Where also just notice the little row of merlons along the top there, the little crenellations, which are exactly like the ones along the Damascus Mosque as well. And this is the time now in Europe where you start to get some very interesting imagery of God as supreme uh, architect of the universe. And he has a set of compasses. Uh, so it's God as geometrician. Uh, and uh, it shows that this is the first time that this level of geometry and geometric understanding seems to have come into mainland Europe. And it's very interesting that it coincides with the with the arrival of these ribbed vaults using their astonishing um, command of, of geometry. Just to quickly mention the um, military innovations as well. So from the Crusades, the, um, Richard the Lionheart, for example, brought back um, many um, military innovations that he'd noticed. Uh, and this is his the Chateau Gaillard, uh, on the Seine between Rouen and Paris. And you'll notice there he's, he's, he's put this sort of scalloped uh, bailey round because he's learnt from the Muslim designs that the curved surfaces are better at deflecting the enemy weapons. And heraldry, it was another interesting um, thing I hadn't expected to find that when the Crusaders um, were in Syria, they saw Saracen knights having jousting competitions on horseback with blunt javelins, and they were wearing on their helmets, they had symbols. So the first fleur, fleur de lis is actually on Nur ad dins helmet. And, and again, we know this because scholars have done detailed work um, researching all of this. So there's a German guy called Meyer who has written a book called Saracenic Heraldry, explaining the background to all of this. And, and so what happens is that the idea was first seen in Syria and the Crusaders bring it back and use it differently and evolve it into the whole heraldic, you know, to do with inheritance and families and coats of arms and, and develop it into that in a way that it was never developed in, in, in the Muslim world. Now, um, this is 
an example of fake news, if you like. This is a, a, a map of Jerusalem dated uh, 1486, showing Jerusalem as the Christians of the time wanted to see it. It was, it was drawn by a uh, pilgrim who was accompanying the um, Bishop of Mainz, who was on pilgrimage, and um, the Venetians at this time were busy um, running package tours almost to the Holy Land. They were getting on very well with, um, uh, uh, you know, they were trading with, with, with the Mamluks, um, often against the wishes of the Pope, um, but they were um, shipping people out in large numbers um, via all the Venetian colonies to then arrive in, in Jerusalem. Uh, and this map shows in center stage, the Dome of the Rock, because the early Crusaders did not realize that this was a Muslim shrine. They actually believed that it was the Temple of Solomon and it's labeled as such on the map. And so the Templars um, you know, copied this church and we, we've got um, the Temple Church in London, you know, Temple Tube Station, there are round Temple churches all over Europe. There's, there's one in Cambridge, um, there's one in uh, several, I think, in, in Portugal. Um, so it is an extraordinary example of something that was so influential. And this was the first pictorial map of Jerusalem ever to be printed. It was translated into many languages. It was printed many, many times. And the mistake um, about the Dome of the Rock was not realized until centuries later. This, this map was carried on being printed. So it was very influential. In, in the design of, of churches. Again, completely based on a, on a misconception. Venice, uh, now St. Mark's in, uh, Christopher Wren even says that this is um, a building which is obviously designed in the Saracen style, he says. And again, you can see the sort of crenellations along the top, the, um, the Islamic double dome, which has um, been brought into Europe by the uh, been copied from, from the Seljuks, who, uh, who that's where it was first seen, and then in Cairo it was seen and, and brought in by, by merchants. And then the Venetians themselves, again, loved arches. You see the arches become more pointed. They've got trefoil arches. Here, this what's called the telephone dial motif on the Palazzo Dario, that's copied from a, a Mamluk palace in Cairo. And then the Doge's palace here on the right, You've got this incredibly detailed, um, uh, you know, very uh, sort of tracery work, very, very like lace almost, very, very detailed. And you've got um, the, the, the crenellations, the merlons along the top there have also become highly decorative. And then this, of course, spawns more copies. Um, the Doge's Palace is a very, very influential building. And one of the strangest copies, it's uh, it produced was, was this carpet factory in, in Glasgow, the Templeton car carpet factory, where again, it's got, um, you know, its own crenellations up there and is copying all the styles, a sort of cathedral of commerce. And here, uh, th this is now in Spain. This is on the left, we have the, um, the cathedral of Burgos, another example that uh, Christopher Wren says is clearly built in the Saracen style. And when he disputes the, the use of the word Gothic, what he, what he actually says is, he says, from the lightness of its work, the, the excessive boldness of its elevations, delicacy, profusion, and extravagant fancy of its ornaments, it could only be attributed to the Moors, or what is the same thing, to the Arabians or Saracens. And it then takes seven centuries to evolve into what we have on the right-hand side of the picture here, um, the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, which is, if you like, the complete, you know, the absolute apogee of, of Gothic. Um, of course, still not finished. It's, it's due to be completed in 2026, um, which is the centenary of Anthony Gaudi's death, the architect's death. Um, it's the most remarkable building, if you like. It, it's, uh, if you wanted to sort of categorize it, you could call it something like Hispano- Saracenic Gothic, and it's it's the ultimate fusion of, of nature, geometry, and religion. It's just so organic the way it, can, it combines all the different features uh, in, into this astonishing creation. And and Gaudi himself openly admits that he was influenced by by Islamic architecture. 
And this is a detail of the nativity facade on the Sagrada Familia. And again, we see this incredible profusion of nature. It's just bursting with, with fertility and life in, in that way that we've come to see, um, you know, for, for in, in, in the Umayyad and then the Christian, uh, all these styles that have come, come through from, from Syria. And then, of course, we have the Gothic revival that takes place in the 19th century, which becomes very influential in many key buildings. So um, Big Ben, and again, the way it goes up in four registers, I can't help noticing, but, you know, it does have certain similarities with, with some minarets. Um, the facade, it's, this is a detail on the right-hand side. It's covered in, in trefoil arches, pointed arches. Uh, and of course, these styles make their way across the Atlantic as well. So in this picture, this is actually in Washington, D.C. This is the National Cathedral. And what have we got here in America? We've got the Twin Towers flanking the monumental arch. We've got the rose window. We've got the trefoil arches. We've got pointed arches. We've got all the crenellations. We've got all those elements that we've seen coming in from, from Syria. And they've been synthesized into something, into something new. And still in America, Gothic becomes very influential in the academic world. Uh, in, in, there are more uh, universities, colleges, and schools in Gothic style in America than anywhere else in the world. And Yale is an almost completely Gothic campus. And so these pictures are both of Yale. On, on, the, on the left there is the Harkness Tower. And on the right is their, one of their main libraries, which looks for all the world like, a, like the nave of a Gothic cathedral. And then, of course, finally, the, um, the US Capitol Dome, the seat, the seat of government, if you like, um, the equivalent of our Houses of Parliament, is, like St Paul's Cathedral, using the Islamic double dome technique of, of where the outer dome projects a different profile to the inner dome. Um, and so it's, it's a slight irony, if you like, that this sort of apparently classical facade is actually concealing an Islamic use of, of geometry inside. And so the whole point of this book really is to show that everything builds on everything else, that, that we can't, you know, no one culture can claim for itself that, oh, you know, this, this is entirely my creation in the way that the French claimed uh, about Notre Dame. We have to realize that the, the only way that, I mean, the reason it evolved is because of the, uh, the fact that people took the best of what they found and synthesized it into something new. And that's exactly what Christopher Wren himself did. He was an open-minded man. And so he was quite prepared to take the best vaulting techniques he could find. And that happened to be what he called the Saracen vaulting. So that's really the message of the book is that it's only through multiculturalism that we manage to take the best from everything and, and move forward with, with new discoveries all the time. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Diana, for a very interesting and detailed talk. I was amazed by the quality of the images. I mean, they are really amazing. So I don't know what type of camera you were using. Um, but, but basically, I wanted to kind of uh, bring up the, the end of the talk uh, for as a point of beginning of discussion, which is, um, and, and, and then returning to the beginning of the talk where you talked about the title, Stealing from the Saracens. In a sense, it, is, um, it seems to me like if we are going to be open to, uh, uh, to cultural uh, kind of uh, encounters, then we need to acknowledge uh, that you know, the, the encounters are, in a sense, important for how we understand the world today. Um, so I see the book, um, or the way that you know, I've read parts of it, and I, I saw it as a, a you know, putting forward uh, a, an argument for the importance of encounters and the importance of understanding cultures uh, in different ways. But I'm still intrigued by the title. So again, uh, stealing from the, the uh, Saracens sounds like um, there had been no acknowledgement uh, of the uh, you know, contribution or um, 
the influence of Islamic and uh, architecture and uh, design uh, on the Western world. So if you could elaborate on that, and then I'll open it up to questions. I can see the beginning. Yes, to... yes. No, no, I mean, this is, this is the, the point is, as I said, it's a very deliberate choice, and it's actually meant to be, um, it's meant to be quite funny in, in a way, the stealing from the Saracen thing. It's not meant to be taken seriously. It, it is an irony, and um, trouble is irony doesn't work very well in, in Arabic. It, it's actually a word that you can't even translate, you know. So in, in a way, it doesn't work. Uh, you know, it, uh, people take it too literally um, when, when actually it's, 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 it's deliberately trying to, to sort of almost poke fun at the whole thing, that here we are, you know, trying to say, oh, this is ours, um, you know, we, 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 only we Europeans, you know, managed to produce a wonderful building like Notre Dame, um, when actually, of course, without any acknowledgement of where most of these ideas came from. But, but of course, it's also true to say um, that in Gothic cathedrals, they were, all these elements were synthesized into something new because um, uh, the, the pointed arch was stronger. This is, this is one of the reasons that enabled um, Gothic cathedrals to get higher and higher and higher and, and, and in a sort of competition almost till, till you get to the, uh, the crazy situation where Beauvais Cathedral went so high that it collapsed, you know, <laughs> and flying buttresses had to be invented to prop them up. <laughs> So uh, actually, uh, you know, my comment is summed up by a brilliant uh, comment from uh, one, of, one of the attendees, uh, Deborah Dunham, who says, thank you for the masterful and beautiful synthesis, connecting so many places I have visited without seeing the artistic multicultural connections. But there's another question uh, which says, um, what are the sources and archives you have used to document the cross-national contacts, learning influences and exchanges you documented Yes, yes, no, no. I mean, the book, um, the book, by the way, has been beautifully produced with over 150 illustrations by Hearst, and it is fully footnoted, so all the sources are given. And um, basically, what I discovered was that early, earlier scholars have done most of the work, it's just that they have researched one particular aspect. And so what somebody like me was able to do was to come along and join the dots, really because people weren't making the connections. But because I was, you know, I, I was lucky enough to already be familiar with the European buildings and with the Middle Eastern buildings, uh, and in some cases also the, 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 the Turkish buildings. I mean, in this presentation, I didn't have time to go into the whole Ottoman things, but, but there are many important things um, that come from there as well. So um, it is, it is uh, um, you know, it is, it is, uh, well, yes, it, it is. Uh, you know, it's it's it is a a very important thing, certainly. Thank you. Um, so we have a question: Did the Saracens also take from the Europeans in terms of architecture, or did you see uh, in your research did you come across that as well? Um, well, very little at, at the beginning, certainly very little. I mean, that that was quite striking that. Um, most of the direction of travel was from east to west in these early stages. I mean, it's only much later that, um, you know, that, uh, that you see signs of, uh, well, architecturally, I mean, really, we're only talking in the modern age, that, that, um, because no, most of these styles did not go um, in, in, in that direction. What did, of course, happen was that um, a lot of the styles that I'm saying you know, started in Syria, of course, didn't necessarily start in Syria either. A lot of them came in from Iran, from Persia, and indeed from further east. You know, these, um, you know, the, in these very, very early civilizations, a lot of these styles, um, that this whole area was quite, it's important to understand how multicultural that part of the world was and multi-ethnic, you know. Um, the whole of the Fertile Crescent was, was a huge melting pot of civilizations and, and um, you know, very, very creative part of the world is obviously why so many of the inventions came from that part of the world as well, because they were busy bouncing ideas off each other the whole time, learning from each other, 
and this is the way um, new new thoughts come into your head from from these sorts of encounters where suddenly you need to do something different because you come up against a different way of doing things and and so you know this is this this is what what's so important to help societies to move forward mm, thank you um i hope that everyone can hear me it seems like i'm muffled but uh there's a question do you think architects of more recent constructions were aware of all these influences and um or do you think that they are not aware of it um in a sense the question is uh, about um, modern architecture, which you might, you know, you might or might not want to answer. Uh, but then a question relevant to um, my uh, my uh, comment about the title. Someone's asking, what are the reactions of people to the way that you interpreted the book uh, versus, um, you know, the, how they interpreted the title of the book versus the excellent research that you presented? Well, um... Yes, uh, I mean, what's been interesting, um, I, I have noticed in, in the reaction to the book, I mean, there's a certain kind of person, if you like, who I suppose is a product of, you know, their education system. But, you know, if you like a sort of, you know, an older person who perhaps, you know, is of the generation of Kenneth Clark's civilization, you know, on the BBC, the very first documentary series I mean if, if anybody can remember I mean people who saw that will realize how incredibly Eurocentric people mm. were at that stage and I was I was a product of that if you like I grew up believing that Europe was the center of the universe and that really the Greeks in, invented everything and that was that <laughs> and it was only when I just, you know changed to study Arabic um, that I realized my goodness you know even the Greeks didn't invent that much, you know, a lot of their ideas came from further east. And so um, I, I, you know, was lucky enough to choose a subject that, that you know, broadened my horizons so that I could see. Um, and of course, you know, over the years that I spent living and traveling in the Middle East, I was able to see so many things that, uh, you know, that we, we think of in Europe as Greek when actually you know, the, the Greeks didn't, um, you know, so, so, so much of it actually came from further east, um, which is, again, hardly surprising, considering that the birthplace of civilization was there between the Tigris and the Euphrates. Mm, thank you. And, um, and on, on, on the modern architecture thing, I mean, I think, you know, I think there are some architects, obviously, who are aware of these things. I mean, Gaudi, I mean, Anthony Gaudi is, is just such an astonishing man. I mean, who was clearly, I think, deeply aware of this um, incredibly uh, sort of organic quality of, of, um, uh, of Islamic architecture. I mean, he, he, he loved the way, I mean, he calls it, it, it actually has a term, fractal geometry, where um, you're, you're, you're kind of copying nature. Um, so, you, you know, you've got these things like snowflakes and mollusk shells, you know, you're, you're kind of, and everything is, is, is you, know, you never have a right angle. And, and he says, you know, there is no right angle in nature. In fact, he even says, you know, I am a geometrician. Um, that is to say, I, I synthesize. I mean, he, under, he completely gets it about what it is in Islamic architecture that makes it so sort of, so so living you know and that there's no kind of intermediary if you like um between between the person experiencing this and, and god and this this was another interesting thing actually to come out of the research you know that, that you've got the linear um hierarchical structure of a gothic cathedral with the long thin nave where you're never in any doubt where the important people are you know they're up by the altar at the eastern end and then and then they're kind of ranked you know in the choir and then the important people are right at the front and and then you know the masses are are at the back and um, you don't you don't have that in in a mosque design at all the fact that you can sit anywhere that there's no furniture um you know this is a, is a very different way of approaching um a, a religious building and um i think I think this is part of what Gaudi completely understood, you know, that, that you, you wanted a building that made you feel as if, you know, you were being embraced by God from the mm. moment you stepped inside it. Mm. That's wonderful. Um, so I have a couple of questions somehow related to each other. Uh, did the Europeans try to conceal the source and claim it their own? 
And another one uh, saying, uh, my question aside from Ren, is the uh, record of much recognition from European architects or uh, patrons of the Saracen sources of the uh, buildings? And whether this is still, uh, whether this is begrudging, um, in, you know, kind of acknowledgement, or whether it is uh, celebratory. So it's related to the questions you we've just answered. So uh, in a sense, um, do you feel that there has been um, looking at the European sources and the European writings on uh, these great buildings and uh, uh, in Europe, uh, did they acknowledge uh, the influence of the Saracens? Um, well, um, I think, you know, a politics comes into this quite a lot. Um, it, it, I mean, you know, you can't get away from the fact that these big public buildings are political statements. It takes a lot of money um, to, to be able to, you know, to build a cathedral. And um, I certainly don't think that Gothic architects, well, you know, the, the profession of architect didn't exist in the Middle Ages. So um, what happens is you have the, the, the bishop or the abbot who, who, who takes the credit. So, so, you know, you have Saint-Denis Saint Denis in, 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 on the outskirts of Paris, which is always credited as the first Gothic building. Um, and yet it remains a mystery quite how that came about. And the abbot there, Abbot Suger, takes total credit for it. You know, he puts himself in the stained glass windows. He, he, you know, there are inscriptions where he makes sure his name is there. There is no clue whatever about who built the buildings. <laughs> simply no mention of it um, because they were just kind of dismissed almost as craftsmen and yet you know knowing what we know now um, and it's very interesting actually with the burning down of Notre Dame this is going to give a huge opportunity for researchers to for the first time in a way to really get to the bottom of some of the construction techniques and I'm I'm hopeful that they might begin to be able to find some of the identities of some of these early masons, because it's very clear. Um, I mean, stonemasons in this country um, acknowledge that there's suddenly this huge leap, you know, when, when Gothic begins, and this coincides with when the Crusaders come back from the Holy Land, suddenly the level of, of construction, the comprehension of geometry, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sort of huge leap um, and how do you explain that? I mean, how does that suddenly happen? Mm. It has to be that that a lot, that some you know people with the knowledge they never got the credit for it, but but they they were brought back. I mean, um, there is evidence that some uh, Muslim masons and craftsmen were brought back as prisoners, for example. There's there's a record. I mean, I mentioned this in the book. There's one who who was brought back um, and builds castles in in Wales and ends up being the, the architect to, to um, one of the Henrys, I can't remember which Henry it is, but um, anyway, so to the king, basically. And um, so you have occasional uh, things like that, where suddenly a Muslim mason crops up and becomes high profile, but most of the time it, it's very hidden, which is why, as I said, you know, finding those mason's marks at the back of, um, at the back of um, the Cordoba Mesquita is, is important. And there are um, places in, in uh, churches and cathedrals in this country where Arabic has been found in the numbering system in some of the carpentry. So Arabic numerals have been found. So in Durham, for example, there, there is some. I mean, research is ongoing on this. And I'm personally convinced that more and more Will will come out about about it as 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 people as more and more work is done on this, and you know the Notre Dame renovation is going to offer a massive opportunity for that. Um, I come to a question from someone on Facebook, but uh, before that, there's a question from Hugh Pope. I think it's the Hugh Pope I know. Um, it, it, thank you for a wonderful theatre talk. You made it all sound so simple. You just answered my question about how these truths were lying in plain sight, but I think there is a good question here. Could you elaborate a bit more on who you mean by Saracens? You made it sound like it's mostly Syrian. 
Mm. Well, well, th this is a disputed term, of course. I mean, the word, you wouldn't believe how, how much time I've spent researching the word Saracens. I mean, and the number of people I've consulted about it, you know. <laughs> but the person who actually um, came up with, I think, the, the most definitive definition um, was my old Arabic professor um, at, at Oxford. And he, um, he dug out, he used to be a classicist. So he dug out a, a, a Roman historian called um, Ammianus, um, who, who um, recorded the Saracens, um, and they appear on a map uh, in the second century AD. So this is pre-Islamic. Pre the, the term Saracens was around pre-Islamic pre uh, as, as a tribal grouping in the North Sinai. Was, was where they're positioned on this very early map. Um, but at some point, um, oh yes, and Ammianus then describes them as, as uh, they, were, they were well known for, for being, for, for looting. <laughs> and uh, so this then, this fits in with my, my thing about thieves and looting and stealing and everything. So, um, but then at some point, and, and the word Saracens comes into common use then um, really from, from, from the Middle Ages onwards, because the Crusaders start to use the word to mean basically all Arab Muslims. It becomes their all-purpose word. And they very often don't distinguish between, um, well, as you, as you heard there with, with, um, with Christopher Wren, he says the Moors, the Arabians, or the Saracens, which is the same thing. You know, that, for him, it's all the same thing. That, that's how, how broad it is, that there was not really any comprehension about you know the differences really. Okay, um, so I just want to bring in a bit of what uh, Dr. Stephen Gaines uh, put in in the uh, Facebook chat. Um, I think you know it's just a matter of clarification. If you could clarify what what you really intended, um, because uh, he think he says that he thinks you are being essentially unhistorical in advancing the idea that seven hundred years of Gothic and neo Gothic architecture is a borrowing uh, or stealing from Islamic or Saracenic or Syrian architecture. Um, so he says this is um, not true unless one predetermines pre all Gothic architecture as essentially Moorish, in which case one is promoting an error of labeling. Um, and then what he goes on to say is that um, the uh, pointed arch that Diana sees everywhere in Moorish architecture is in fact often a false or only accidental pointed arch. Uh, so in a sense, uh, in a sense, maybe you could respond to this, um, to this comment uh, by, by, by reinforcing the point around, you know, the exchange, you know, the encounters and exchange that I think came across very clearly. Um, but if you don't feel, you know, don't really want to uh, respond uh, to this uh, statement, then. Well, well, no. I mean, what I, what I'm, I, I, I will respond certainly, um, because what I'm doing in the book is showing how all the elements that are common to Gothic. So we're talking the pointed arch, the trefoil arch, um, the ribbed vault. Um, these, these three key elements, and then there are lots of sort of smaller elements like the rose window, if you like, the, the, the twin towers, the, um, uh, of course, the twin towers and the monumental entrance is, 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 is pre-Islamic. So, so that, that, that gets taken on into, uh, you know, it, it, that, that obviously the, the, the Muslims adopt that from, their, from the earlier tradition. But, but, but the things that, that the Muslims seem to have genuinely innovated are the rib vaulting did not exist at that point. I mean, the rib vaulting in the Cordoba Mesquita, there was nothing like that on European soil. So the techniques for doing that found their way into southern France and then start to be used in early Cluniac buildings um, along the route to Compostela and then, and then find their way further north um, and get used in, in, in the Gothic cathedrals. And, and again, it takes centuries and centuries and centuries, obviously, of refining it before you get to something like, um, you know, King's College Chapel in Cambridge with the absolute apogee, and it takes many centuries to reach that. But the point is the starting point was the Cordova Mesquita. This technology did not exist in the European mainland before. The trefoil arch, there is no trefoil arch in Roman or Byzantine architecture. It came in via the uh, Umayyads into Muslim Spain. 
and the pointed arch, as I explained, came in via Amalfi. So all these elements um, get get taken, get cherry picked, if you like, and synthesized then into something new in Gothic. And what I feel it does, once you sort of understand uh, that, it gives, it deepens your appreciation of Gothic architecture. I mean, I now look, you know, at my local parish church, which is covered in trefoil arches and pointed arches, and it gives me a much deeper understanding and appreciation of it. It's, it's, a, it's a lovely thing to sort of, you know, instead of just glancing at it and not thinking about it, it, it actually enriches one's own experience of these buildings. Thank you, that really explains it. Um, I want to come to an interesting question, which uh, from Vera uh, Ziade, which says, when the empires were copying from each other, were they affected by religion, culture, arts, politics, language, and so on? Uh, because I think it is much uh, bigger than uh, just taking architectural elements. Um, so in a sense, do you kind of, when you look at the uh, architectural, uh, uh, you know, uh, borrowing uh, in 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 all these uh, buildings. Uh, do you also con do you also kind of uh, look at the historical context, at the you know religious context, the cultural context? Um, um, yes, I do. I do. Uh, where it's because it's actually very relevant. Um, as I said, you know, politics. I mean, you know. Christopher Wren was very aware of the politics of architecture. You know, he, he says, you know, this creates a national identity. Um, and, and, you know, it is, it is a very important political statement. And, and each new civilization, when, they, when it comes in, wants to build something that's bigger and better than, than what came before. I mean, it carries on, you know, today in the Gulf, places like Dubai, you know, want the biggest and tallest skyscraper, you know, because they want to show that they are the biggest and the best. You know, it, it, it's always been like that with with architecture. Um, that, um, and it tends to require a, a combination of um, uh, a new, very ambitious and powerful ruler, combined with a great deal of money, and and then having the right the right people around him. And what what happens so often? in these, uh, when it came to then designing a new building, was that um, that powerful ruler would would call in the best of everything he could find. So, you know, it was very common um, for, you know, the empire to be scoured for, you know, the best quality marble and for it to be pillaged off other buildings and brought back to create, you know, a new building that, that, that was to represent you know, I mean, the Hagia Sophia being being a classic case of that. You know, um, mm. where where so much was brought there from all over. You know, the best was brought from everywhere, and of course, the best craftsmen were were assembled as as well. I mean, we just um, but they they individually almost never get any credit. That 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 comes much later. Um, mm. It's only in the later Gothic that you start to get a name of of the master mason, as he's referred to. That the term architect as such comes in very, very late. I mean, even in Christopher Wren's day in, in the 17th century, the profession of architect did not exist. I mean, he was called the master surveyor to, to the king at, at that time. You know, I mean, it, mm. we, we think of, oh, they must always have been architects, but um, it, was a, it was a very novel um, idea and really, really quite, quite late coming in. And, and also just to mention that the term Gothic, I mean, these terms themselves are, Sort of all slightly are all very recent actually i mean gothic as a as a term was only uh, coined in the in the 16th century by an italian um art historian called vasari and he he uses the term gothic and he also coins the term renaissance and for some reason these are the terms that have stuck so mm -hmm. you know i mean it's interesting that people have people like wren and a few others as well mainly in France, interestingly, have challenged this definition of Gothic and said how ridiculous, you know, that where the Goths, you know, are sort of heavy and, and um, you know, and they're known for destroying things rather than building things. So, you know, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't stand up. Um, so they, um, you know, the terms themselves are, are, quite, are quite misleading in a way. And, um, you know, it's like Byzantine. I mean, the, the Byzantines didn't call themselves Byzantines, and we called them that much, much later. 
Mm, that's right. Um, so I have two questions. One is uh, would Temple Church and Templar churches not being modeled on, uh, are not, would, would it be possible that they're not being modeled on the Holy Sepulchre Church in Jerusalem rather than the Dome of the Rock? And there's someone who's asking about contribution of Persian architecture, uh, mm. whether you talk about that in your book. Yes, well, with the, with the Dome of the Rock, I mean, it's very clear, as I said, from that map and from the, the way the maps are labeled, um, uh, that the, the Holy Sepulchre was not, was not influential in, in that sense. It, it, was, um, it was actually a very, um, uh, the building itself of the Holy Sepulchre went through many, many changes and, and was destroyed and then rebuilt and destroyed and rebuilt, you know, and it, it's, whereas the Dome of the Rock has, has basically stayed in that, in that shape, I mean, in that um, octagonal shape. And uh, I mean, it, it's, not, it's not disputed at all by art historians that, um, that, that, that it is borrowed from, from the Dome of the Rock. Um, so, I mean, just, just to give you some sense of, um, you know, some, some of the other sort of early scholarship, I mean, the Doge's Palace um, in, in Venice, for instance, is, is apparently modelled on the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. And, and the, the, the scholar who has, um, who has concluded that after extensive research is, is a lady called Deborah Howard, who was the um, professor of um, architectural history at Cambridge. And she, she spent 10 years writing a book called Venice and the East, where, where again, you know, it's very, very detailed research. And she goes deeply into uh, all sorts of manuscripts and sources. Um, so so uh, on most occasions, um, what I'm doing here is drawing together all of this different scholarship, which, which has not been, nobody has attempted to, to pull all the threads together in the way that I'm doing, but the actual scholarship has been done by earlier scholars than me, by people who've devoted you know, decades to researching one particular aspect. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, so I want, you know, loads of people saying brilliant lecture, thank you, they really enjoyed it. Uh, there's one question here about the link between Saracen's architecture and orthodox edifices. Um, maybe uh, he's referring, uh, the, the, the uh, question comes from Felix, and he's referring to the domes specifically. Um, so do you have any comments on that? Oh, well, the whole question of domes, yes, there's virtually a whole chapter devoted to domes. <laughs> And it is fascinating. I mean, the way they evolve um, and what they mean. And, and I mean, yes, there's a, there is a whole chapter, quite a lengthy chapter devoted to domes. And it talks about the Seljuks and the Ottomans, as well as the earlier examples, obviously, in, in Constantinople and Hagia Sophia. Um, incidentally, with Hagia Sophia, we have to, we, we always hold up the dome as this great wonder. It's worth remembering that it kept falling down. <laughs> It wasn't, wasn't quite the wonder that some people imagine. It fell down after 20 years. It was repaired so many times. And um, they've had to add something like 26 buttresses to hold it up. I mean, Sinan himself, the great Ottoman architecture, was, was, was also involved in one of the many um, you know, restorations because it kept on falling down. And it's, it's, it's got iron chains around the dome holding it up even, even now. You know, it is... <laughs> <laughs> and that is not a double dome, you see, this is the thing, it, it's the earlier technology, um, mm. and, and so whereas the later, um, the, all the Ottoman mosques in Istanbul are all using the double dome technique and have not fallen down, mm. structurally they are much stronger, um, you know, because, because they, they have evolved, you know, they, 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 they're using geometry to, to a higher level, um, mm. but yes, there are um, very interesting that the, the evolution of the dome is itself a fascinating topic and that actually slightly brings me to um, part of a question you asked earlier but which I didn't get a chance to answer about the about Persia and the Iranian um, uh, influences as well. Um, obviously I'm not majoring on that in the book but I do cover it um, up to a point yes and, and certainly domes um, you know some of the earliest examples of you know um, uh, some sort of canopy over the head of the ruler, for example, 
uh, occurs in places like Persepolis in, in Iran. So, so um, you know, there are very early examples and, and Sasanian architecture also comes in um, and clearly influences Umayyad, Umayyad architecture as well. So, so yes, I mean, you know, these, these we, we have to keep looking eastwards as well. Mm. And there's a related question, but about the vaults uh, from about, our, about what? Sorry, about vaulting, uh, or vaulting yeah. in cathedrals. So the question is: Muqarnas are cited to serve an acoustic purpose, in that they help transport sound back. But do examples of ornamental vaulting in, in cathedrals serve the same purpose? Um, I don't believe that they do, um, although very interestingly, the one, um, the one cathedral where uh, sort of Makarnas, if you like, are, are sort of are used um, in, in a way is the Sagrada Familia. And, and of course, Gaudi himself um, was very, very conscious of acoustics and light and the interplay between uh, between all of that and, and so he's when he's when he designed the building i mean you know it's been so long in the making you know that it, i mean he he worked on it for 43 years um until he tragically was was killed in a in a tr tram accident um and and you know so people have been working on it for so long because it is it is um the level of perfection and 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 dedication in every little detail is so is so massive um, uh, but he wasn't going to be rushed with it all I and mean, he had a, he had when people rebuked him about um, you know how long it was all taking he he said my client is not in a hurry <laughs> and nobody nobody could answer that really <laughs> I have a brilliant question from Mary Holmes, where she says, within architectural education, uh, there is often a huge precedent of constructing a linear history from which modernism emerges as a product, product of mainly Western epistemologies. Mm. To what do you think that an education on architectural histories uh, that raises awareness of the multi multiplicity of cultural influences on architect uh, architectural development aids in the production and the synthesis of new ideas and architectures. Um, absolutely. I, I mean, I do wish, I do wish that a broader, you know, less Eurocentric way of thinking about things would gradually come into the education system. I mean, everybody would benefit from that. And it would be so much more inclusive, you know, instead of this sort of exclusive Eurocentric way of looking at everything, um, you know, it would, it would, it would just open people's eyes to how much broader all of these influences are. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I really, I really do hope that, it, you know, a book like this leads people to slightly rethink the way that they approach topics like architecture. Mm. Fantastic. Um, and so we have perhaps a final question, which is, will you ever venture into writing a book on later Islamic influence of Ottoman Mughal and Safavid uh, architecture directly and clear influence on Western architecture. Now you have that you have clarified in this book early Islamic influence, Umayyad, Abbasid, Seljuk, and so on, on Gothic and medieval uh, architecture. So it is, um, you know, you, uh, you uh, kind of. Uh, what well, are you yeah, yeah, no, I understand. I understand the question. I mean, and the answer is I'm not. I'm not focused on that specifically. To be honest, I'm still very, very focused on all of these um, things that I keep, I keep learning. I mean, I keep learning from from the audiences actually of of talks. I mean, I some of the questions and things that people have pointed out to me um, that I didn't know about, and and so there is so much more to discover. Uh, um, my my book is just, if you like, the beginning of, of bringing all these threads together. Um, there is really so much more. I mean, there's a particular thing I'm pursuing at the moment, um, which is all about the um, what what often architecturally gets referred to as the chevron, but it's basically the zigzag, the zigzag design. And I don't know if you're familiar with Durham Cathedral, it's got, you know, in the pillars of the nave, it's got this very striking sort of almost primitive zigzag pattern mm -hmm. on the um, on, on one of the pillars. And, uh, and, it, and when you look it up, it, it sort of 
it refers to it as, oh, a very distinctive Normanesque or Romanesque, you know, because um, Romanesque is Norman in, in, in Britain. It's what is what William the Conqueror brought over in 1066, you know, and, and so Canterbury Cathedral, you know, or, or basically the Normans rebuilt all our churches and cathedrals in, in, in the Gothic style, the Norman style, which incidentally at that time was simply known as the French style before it was dubbed Gothic centuries later. It was just known as the French, the French style. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I, I, I'm, I'm developing a theory that um, this zigzag was actually brought back by the Normans from Syria and the Holy Land because the zigzag is a very common pattern. I mean, I've got it in the courtyard of my Damascus house. All, all around the top, there are zigzags going round. And I was told that it's a very early Mesopotamian um, uh, design. And, and in that fascinating um, series of documentaries, The Secret History of Writing, that the BBC ran um, back in October, um, there was a very interesting episode that talked about the early Canaanite um, uh, hieroglyph that then becomes, you know, the alphabet, where the symbol for water is just a zigzag, mm -hmm. a zigzag, which then, and, and, and the, um, it was known as my, Mayin, you know, I mean, clearly a word that then comes into Aramaic as the Maya, you know, and all, all the variations of water in Arabic. Um, and the fact it would make sense if, if that was water, if you like, if that was representing water, um, it would be, um, you know, because it's also linked with a symbol of power. And of course, power and water go together. The Seljuks used this, this symbol. Um, the, the, the Doge's palace has got this chevron on the front, again, as a sort of copying, according to Deborah Howard, from the Seljuk sort of power symbol. Um, and I, you know, I, I mean, I can't prove it. I'm, I'm trying to prove it through, through, <laughs> through trying to track it back. But, um, you know, I, I personally think the, the Normans have got that design and brought it in. They didn't invent that, that they have brought it in because they recognized it as a power symbol um, that was being used in, in, in the East, you know, and brought it, brought it through. So, so there are still so many things and I'm still obsessed with stained glass. So I'm still going to be, be stuck in this for a little while longer, I think, until I satisfy my curiosity on all these counts. We look forward to that book. Uh, but, but kind of when you talk about the chevron and you talk about the water and so on, this links to uh, one comment or one question, in, uh, which will be the final one I'll be asking. Um, Tony Muslih asked if, if uh, I would like to ask if you know during which time the very direct representation of nature in Islamic architecture were translated in more abstract geometric representation of nature. Um, so if um, I don't know whether that is something we looked at, but but whether you know it might be something a question that might uh, direct you for um, future research that we'll be looking forward to reading. Well, it it it's an interesting question certainly, and I mean in a way um, it makes me think of the Alhambra, you know, which is obviously not. I do cover the Alhambra in the book, although obviously it's later. So Gothic has already arrived, but, but it, it was very influential in, in the Gothic revival um, the, as a building because of all the people who started to visit it on their grand tours and things. But, but if, you, if you like, I mean, you do get a sense in the Alhambra of the use of geometry and the patterns, um, which, which are the sort of endlessly repeating patterns of nature. Um, and certainly on European soil, that's the first time that it's used on such a scale, um, mm. the endlessly repeating patterns that you know so influence people like Max Escher, um, and uh, so yeah, I mean it 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 is a sort of progression in a way to, towards these geometric patterns, which um, uh, which which are at the end of the day creating a sense of sort of infinity and 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 therefore you know you can lose yourself. In, in, in the sort of search for God in, uh, mm. in uh, you know, in, in these patterns, mm. which is, I think, why they are endlessly popular. Yes. <laughs> why they're, you know, whenever there are classes run on, on, the, on things like, um, you know, Islamic geometry and designs, they're always oversubscribed. 
thank you. Um, I think we have managed to answer most of the questions because they were interrelated. A lot of them were asking around uh, questions around whether the Europeans acknowledge the influence, whether uh, modern arch architects acknowledge that influence. Um, I, I think you, you do produce a, a history of architecture that is uh, non-Eurocentric, which is uh, really exciting for uh, us at SOAS and will be very important for students trying to understand the, uh, the exchange of ideas and that not everything needs to come from one way to the other way. Mm. Um, so it, it falls within that line of, uh, of thinking. And we hope that you know you're going to produce some some more on this work. And then you know if you look at the stained glass, I I'll be delighted <laughs> to talk about stained glass because mm. it's so um, I think there, there, there hasn't been anything out there uh, as far as I know that uh, covers this. Um, but we really apologize for the sound. I've had a lot of people asking about the sound and so on, and uh, I don't know you know I I I've heard everything very clearly. And for those people who asked about the recording, we will be, this, will, this is recorded and we will be putting it up uh, as soon as we can. I cannot give you the time when it's going to be available um, uh, for you to, to look back and kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, look again at the brilliant presentation and the visuals. Uh, those, were, those were amazing. Um, but thank you, Diana. Thank you so much for taking time to come and speak to us. Thank you for all the audience and the questions. And we do hope that you managed to hear us and apologize again for uh, the sound. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dina. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.